we've all got our paranoid delusions. Me personally, mine these days are something to the effect of, what if I forgot to turn the water off? What if I forgot to lock all the doors? Did I completely close the refrigerator? What if I was walking through the woods during day for night and there was a mummy and he bit me? Yeah, that'd be pretty friggin' spooky, wouldn't it? But all of these metaphorical and literal creatures pale, nay, shudder, when the scariest monster of them all is mentioned. Horror Movie DVD Box Sets It's that time of the year once again, boys and ghouls. I'm gonna torture myself once again with another one of these crummy movie packs released by Mill Creek to look for some potential gems. Now last year I looked at two movie packs. I looked at a pack of classic horror movies in the summer, and a pack of overwhelmingly bad science fiction films for Halloween. Last spring I looked at an oddly specific pack of mad scientist films, so the theme for this Halloween is creatures. Features with creatures, more commonly known as monster movies. Be it big or small, mythological or contemporary, this set's got it all. I have even less opportunities to find a good movie now because out of the 50 here, I've already covered 26 over the combined three previous sets, leaving me with 24 to look at. I don't have as much ground to cover in this series, but 24 films is still a lot. I ordered the films in a way that avoids repetition, so I'm going to try to make it so that you don't see two werewolf movies in one video. As for content warnings, once again, these are older films. You should know what you're getting into. They're very much products of their time. Some of these are also exploitation films, so some of the plot elements here can get pretty racy. Let's cut the preamble short. It's time to get spooked. Hey, look at this guy! This film is labeled as Monster on the DVD menu, but the actual title is Monstroid. Or is it actually monster. No friggin' idea, it's both. Right off the bat, the film hits you with a this is based on a true story blurb. Monster, a true story of a legend that becomes an unholy horror. Yep, this is all real. This actually happened. So anyways, the film takes place in a small town in Colombia, where a cement plant's operations are being threatened by a giant monster, and an evil CEO Mick businessman wants to figure out what's going on. It's a monster, you non-genre savvy moron. The cement waste is being deposited into the monster's lake, so I'd be pissed too. If the old monster in the lake bit again, grrr! B-movie man John Carradine plays a priest in this one. This was pretty late into his career, so he's visibly worn down by bad movies at this point. He has planted an emissary among us. <laughs> There's this whole subplot with him where the disappearance of people is blamed on a woman who's labeled as a witch. I saw it! It's true! It's true! It doesn't have a whole lot to do with the main plot about baiting out the monster. The other characters aren't exactly winning any points for being compelling either. They're all the usual archetypes. There's the reporter lady who's exposing a pollution problem in the town. There's this guy the cast keeps talking about named Sanchez who's going around warning people about the monster while committing acts of terrorism on the cement plant. And then there's this evil CEO the film keeps cutting back to, and he's swearing up a storm. Why the hell didn't you kick a f ass out of Chimayo? That's the only real indication this wasn't something made in the 60s. There's no way dialogue like this would be uttered in the squeaky clean monster films this is a supposed send up to. It's funny, but it's also so inexplicable. I want her ass out of there today. The movie does the usual monster movie thing where it doesn't show a lot of the creature right away, instead relying on POVs and quick close-ups of the monster in shadow. But what we do see of it at first isn't impressive and it only gets worse when we see it in daylight. In fact, it's quite funny. Yeah, the crappy monster is the real highlight of the film. It's a likably bad prop that looks like a cross between an eastern dragon and a walrus. It's hard to believe this movie came out in the 80s. 
a decade known for its incredible creature animatronics. Christ, I don't believe it! With the stock music, very typical premise, the corny blurb at the start, and the presence of John Carradine, I get the sense that Monstroid was intended to be a send-up of classic monster movies. I mean, you don't make a movie like this in 1980 without it being a little intentional, right? Well, no. The film plays itself pretty straight. I think we have a genuine case of the room not being properly read here. The performances from everyone except that swearing guy are pretty lukewarm. The pacing up until the last 10 minutes especially suffers from a lot of town politics and trite melodrama. And needless to say, the visuals on this transfer are murky, to a degree where I can't make out certain scenes. I mean, you know the deal by now. I've already done enough of these reviews where that's obvious. You can see it. It looks like crap. Thanks, Mill Creek. Look at it! It's as big as a whale! If there's one positive I can give, some of the camera work is alright. The shot where the camera travels through the cockpit of the helicopter is super extra, but it adds a little visual flair to an otherwise transitory scene. And, again, that crappy monster is just wonderful. You see plenty of it in the final act, and it's worth the wait. Monstroid has its moments, but maybe it's a bit too dull for most viewers. I mean, the movie's title is simply Monster. Says a lot about how bland it is. Very skippable, but also watchable if you're in the mood for some cheap laughs in the last 10 minutes. The final shot of this film is a doozy. What you have just witnessed is not a movie of the week. Yeah, okay. Snake women, you say? Snake girls. Nah, it's not the cringe anime kind. It's the cringe live-action B-movie kind, where the title character is more woman than snake. I'd say it's false advertising, but it's technically correct. The film itself is a British production, a period piece set in the early 1900s. It starts with a mad scientist, man, I'm getting some flashbacks here, who's using snake venom to cure his wife's ailments while she's pregnant. The wife dies, but the baby survives, and it ends up having the traits of a snake, thanks to the poison he injected. You're lost! You're cursed! You're doomed! I love the acting and some of the dialogue in this. It's theatrical and aggressively British. What will it do to my unborn child? So that's it. There's this extended shot at the start of the movie where this guy just spends a full 30 seconds squeezing venom out of a snake. It's not only animal abuse caught on film, but it's also the first sign that the pacing of this flick is gonna be a little slow. So after the extended prologue sequence, we see the snake baby years later as a fully grown woman. After a man appears to have died from a cobra bite, an investigation into the matter begins. The investigator goes to the village and meets the snake lady, who he charms with a snake flute. Yes, really. And the rest of the film lurches into action as more people eventually die. This one is maybe a little too talky. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed of in your philosophy. Okay, it's overly talky. It's not awful, but the few attempts at scares fail to make an impact. I don't mind this kind of dialogue-heavy format if it's compelling and there's a reason for me to care. But so much time in The Snake Woman is spent recounting information the viewer already knows, waxing philosophical, or drinking tea. So they killed the father and destroyed the child. No, not the child. It takes roughly half an hour for the actual story of a snake woman going around biting dudes to take off. The most exciting thing that happens in this film is when the investigator finds the snake woman's molted skin. It's like... Wow, a special effect that infers a sort of snake-like transformation or attribute. You know, that's freaky. Then the movie goes back to being underwhelming. And for a movie that explains itself at every turn, I still don't know what's going on in that ending. The old lady tells the investigator to shoot the snake woman three times. He shoots a snake and then she fades into nothing? Did she turn into the snake? Why did she molt if she can also turn into a tiny snake at will without having to molt? 
Was that the implication from the guy looking away for a second and the snake being there where the lady was? Did she actually turn into the snake or was that just weird filmmaking? And then his boss burns the recounting of the story, which means the whole film amounted to nothing. Nobody will ever know what happened. But yeah, movie's a bit dull in it. Next film, please. I think we better go home and discuss this thing in the morning. The next film is Beast of Haunted Cave, which, according to Google, is as long as Lord of the Rings. So this is a Roger and Gene Corman-produced film about a group of criminals hiding out in a cabin after stealing a bunch of gold. Meanwhile, there's a monster in a cave that kills people. Yeah, the monster stuff is pretty tacked onto this one. The cave is literally called Haunted Cave, too. My name's Jack. <laughs> oh, really? No, I was only kidding, it's Marty. The character stuff is hard to care for. It's a lot of snide small talk and discussing plans to steal gold or whatever. That combined with some rather flat but functional filmmaking and some weak performances makes this a very passive viewing experience. The heist and monster storylines feel incidental from one another. That immediate disconnect immediately disinterests me. And then lines like this pull me back in. Here goes the roller coaster! There is a part where I thought the movie was being more fun than it was. There's this scene where the criminals stop to rest, and in the foreground we see this sort of blob. At first I thought this was the monster. I mean, I thought this was a cool little thing of showing the monster spying on them or something. But then it scrolls up with the film and the visuals sputter for a bit. In reality, this was probably some mold on the physical film that got imprinted into the transfer, which is disgusting. Being a low-budget production, and considering this was shot on location during the winter, I was worried they would spend a lot of time showing the characters skiing and hiking, you know, to fill that runtime. I got some nasty flashbacks to the snow creature at times. Luckily, these are just transitory scenes that don't go on for too long. For a monster that was probably thrown together at the last minute, I don't dislike the design of this thing. There isn't a lot to it, we mainly only see parts of its body and tentacles for most of the film, but I like how when the film finally shows it, it's vaguely spider-like. It wraps up people in silk, like a spider, and the decision to film it with a cranked up speed makes its movements somewhat creepy. You know, that's something. They had something interesting going with the creature in this film. But yeah, Beast from Haunted Cave is a bit of a snooze. Not terrible by any means. It's way more competent than I was expecting. But I couldn't get into the characters in this one. The version of this movie found on this collection appears to be a longer TV edit that adds a couple scenes and extends the movie by seven minutes. So, if you want even more scenes of barely distinct characters and rooms talking, this is the cut for you. Gotta love a movie that just ends. Grave of the Vampire. The first vampire movie I get to cover here. After a woman is... exploitation movied by a vampire. Maybe this wasn't a very good first pick. The woman becomes pregnant. While she thinks it's her now-late boyfriend's at first, yeah, he got impaled on a gravestone, it turns out to be the child of the vampire. Rather abruptly, the film skips ahead years later, where the now fully grown Spawn tries to track down his vampire dad and kill him. He attends an adult seminar and, sure enough, his vampire dad is the professor, and is using his position to find more victims. Yeah, the premise of this one is pretty disturbing, but it's a decently creepy setup. But Lola Blossom's gonna do a dance! And we got all the freshmen dressed up like dogs so they can crawl on their knees and bark at her! What the fuck? <coughs> Anyways, thankfully they know better than to linger on the scene in the beginning, and they do know how to set the mood aside from that. The film opens on this extended shot on a coffin. Fog is rolling in. The raspy breathing coming from inside the coffin gets louder. It's an effectively creepy first impression. Heck, I think a lot of the film before the time skip is alright. The premise is creepy, and some of the filmmaking is pretty classical. 
After that time skip, they introduce a lot more characters to keep track of and spend a lot of time on the exposition. It's not bad, it just could have been better. The grown-up vampire baby, an adult if you will, isn't a very compelling character. He's kind of half vampire, but he's resisting his temptations. He's like Alucard from Castlevania, if he couldn't backdash and didn't like spaghetti. Can I fix you some spaghetti? No, thank you. Yeah, this movie has some pretty weird dialogue. Oh, I don't feel like stuffing myself with any damn spaghetti. A part of me wishes it was more about the mother raising the vampire baby, and the conflicts arise from the trials and tribulations of that. But nah, she dies half an hour in. The vampire dad appears to have psychic visions when his son is having sex. If the relationship with his mother wasn't so... demonetizable, he would have been a really weird father. There's a scene at the end of the movie where the son morbs out and finally gets his vampire teeth. And you can see the white plastic jaws on the dollar store teeth when he opens his mouth. It's pretty funny. It's Mormon time! Huh! But yeah, Grave of the Vampire is actually pretty watchable. The dialogue can be strange. You make a groovy medium, Professor. And the movie, it could have been as more interesting than the movie it is, but it's got some creepy visuals. The more deliberate pacing does work in its favor, and I was engaged through most of it, regardless of its shortcomings. That final scene when the son brawls with his vampire dad is a lot of fun, too. It's the best movie so far. Check it out if you're curious. Any movie that ends like this is a winner in my book. I've been yelled at for not mentioning Barbara Steele was in a couple other movies I've talked about. So here I'm rectifying that by saying she's in this next movie, The She-Beast. Well, she's barely in it, but you know, she's in it. The advertising for this one claims this She-Beast is deadlier than Dracula, wilder than the werewolf, and more frightening than Frankenstein. You mean the doctor or the monster? Gotta love vintage advertising. It's not too far off base either. I mean, I wouldn't say she's deadlier than him since she seems to be apprehended in every other scene, but Dracula actually existed in the film's universe. Do you know the Draculas by any chance? Ah. <coughs> Anyways, this definitely isn't the first Italian production I've covered on this channel. The she-beast in question is this witch with a gnarly face, and I gotta say, this movie has a stellar opening. We open on this weird guy wandering around aimlessly for the first three minutes until he starts reading a diary. This isn't the stellar part, please wait. This all takes place in Transylvania, of all places. The diary recounts an incident with a witch, who is named Bardella, and is killed after, okay, this is the stellar part, being staked into a catapult and dipped into a lake. The only part that's missing that would have made this just incredible is if she was launched from the catapult. The guy reading this is somehow unfazed, and this guy in question is actually a Count. Count Van Helsing, to be exact. And after a man's wife is possessed by the witch, it's up to him and her husband to try and exorcise her. Well, it takes a while to get to that. The witch possessing her is supposed to be the inciting incident, but it takes 28 minutes to get to that. Until then, it's a lot of goofing around and dealing with a real creep of an innkeeper. I... I don't... I don't know. It really takes a while for the she-beast to really do anything. Van Helsing brings her back to life 43 minutes in, and so far the innkeeper has proven to be a more vile person. His name is even Groper. He does eventually get his comeuppance, thankfully. After everything this guy's done, the witch almost seems heroic. Fans of Barbara Steele don't take too kindly to this one because she's barely in it but the rest of the film is reasonably entertaining, if not slow. The She-Beast herself takes a while to show up and she kills maybe only a handful of people. She's apprehended way too easily. Dracula was definitely deadlier than her. 
There's also some weird comedy in this one. Towards the end of the film, there's a car chase sequence that feels somewhat out of place. The cops are being utter buffoons, and it feels like a Three Stooges bit. The soundtrack during this sequence actually goes boing. You know, like a cartoon. Shortcomings of the pacing and tone aside, like seriously, this barely has a three-act structure, I also enjoyed this one. The characters are distinct, Van Helsing especially being an eccentric performance, the she-beast is pathetic in a funny way, and the script can be enjoyable. Privacy breeds conspiracy. It's wonky, but if this seems like something you'd like, give it a look. I'll take what I can get, this was way more enjoyable than the first three movies. The next film is titled Voodoo Black Exorcist. Okay, not great vibes from the title. I couldn't tell you how, but it sounds like it could be racist. So the premise of this is just a Caribbean version of The Mummy, where a woman and a man in ancient times commit adultery and are punished for it by death. After being stabbed ritualistically and having every pair of boobs in the village swung in his face, there are honestly worse ways to go out, the mummy is put in a sarcophagus, and 1,000 years later he is placed on a cruise. After a passenger recites a verse several rooms away, that's all it takes for the mummy to be revived, I guess. The mummy returns to his less dry form and sees who he believes to be the reincarnation of his long-lost lover. A rather lethargic and poorly edited monster movie unfolds. It had something going for a while, but after the first act, it's all over the place. In infinite time, what must happen, happens. My favorite moment has to be the scene where this guy tries to steal the mummy's ring. He wakes up and, without missing a beat, Pimp slaps him away. It's wonderful, I love it. Another great moment is when the mummy first beheads someone. It cuts to a very obvious paper mache head, and it's just so, so obviously not the same head. It's like it aged 100 years between shots. There's also this genuinely pretty fun reveal with this close-up of a man's face, and then the camera pulls back and it's revealed to be a disembodied head. I like that, that's cool. This film makes repeated use of flashbacks to the same events over and over and over again. It's disorienting. Which is ironic considering flashbacks are supposed to provide clarity. Whoa! Is that blackface, dude? I swear, it cuts to the same beheading scene from the first five minutes at least, like, six times. The makeup on the mummy is pretty lousy, too and his motivation makes less and less sense as the movie trudges along. At first I thought he was going after the reincarnated versions of the people who murdered him, but then it seems like he just goes after whoever is around. He also just seems to transform back to mummy mode at random. Your normal state. Last long? Variable. I also depend on the sun, and various cosmic factors. This movie just lost its main thread so horribly. This is also the first movie I've looked at in one of these collections that has Mill Creek's watermark appearing at random. Yes, a movie with this many visible scratches. This was the movie they wanted to put their stamp of authenticity on. Where is he? I'm here next to you. I'm sorry, but I don't have a lot to say about this one. It's a low-rent, occasionally flashy, but very dull remake of Universal's The Mummy that lacks as much coherency. The pacing is all over the place with the extended, typical B-movie song and dance sequences, and the truncated dialogue scenes plagued by bizarre jump cuts and, conversely, needlessly long moments that add nothing. It's entirely possible the version of this movie on the box set is a hack job. It's five minutes shorter than other versions of the movie I found, so I really hope that's the case and the editing of the original cut isn't this egregiously bad. With that in mind, it's not completely fair to judge that aspect since it's clearly been butchered, but the material here doesn't compel me to sit down and watch it again. There wasn't even an exorcist in this movie. 
As an aside, I was watching this in a Discord call, and my viewing partner did some digging and found this promotional item for the film. This dude means business, so watch out when your nerves start to shatter. We are not responsible to any person this film may disturb, either physically or mentally. Color. Oh boy, you know you're in for a treat when you start watching a movie called Night Fright, and the very first shot is in Day for Night. In fact, the entire movie is exclusively shot with this aggressive blue filter. Not a single scene was shot at actual night. <laughs> After a space rocket crashes completely off-screen, a monster presumably emerges from it and goes around killing people, and it's up to a sheriff played by John Agar to point his gun at it. Yeah, that's it. That's Night Fright. Okay, there's a little more to this one. The film begins with two cold opens before the title card, which happens 11 minutes in. The first sees the monster killing two teenagers in the dead of day for night and the second is this nearly nine minute long diversion dedicated to another teenage couple finding the bodies. This sequence exists purely to waste time. You could easily cut from the first cold open to the title card, and the movie would have a stronger first impression. This is one of those squeaky clean 60s flicks too, so you don't even get to see the bodies they find. So it's lacking even that visceral element. Which I'd imagine would have been more disappointing to people in the 80s, because this film was apparently re-released as ETN. The Extraterrestrial Nasty. Yeah, nah, there's not a drop of blood in this film. I'm gonna give you about one minute to turn this car around and get out of here, because I'm about to lose my patience. Night Fright feels like a movie I've already seen. Ditzy teenagers, filler scenes of people driving or stumbling through the woods because you don't need filming permits to shoot a movie there, and because it fills time. There's an extended song and dance scene, a repetitive soundtrack that sounds like stock music, John Agar is here. I could easily see this as a double feature from Hell with Zontar the Thing from Venus. There's no tension. Heck, there's one point where I thought something was about to happen, but nope, it's just feral hogs. You can walk away and do laundry at any point in the movie, and you honestly wouldn't be missing much. It's all very predictable and slow. All the teenager characters are pretty interchangeable too, so the movie doesn't even have a memorable cast. When the monster does show up, you can barely see it because of the aggressively applied blue filter for the day for night. It's a fluffy ape-like creature, I think? It's apparently a test subject that was shot into space, and it came back looking like that. The scene where the movie intercuts between the monster attacking a police officer and another officer making coffee just perfectly encapsulates the lack of shit-giving going on here. Films like these, more often than not, have extended sequences dedicated to dancing. Like, seriously, it's so frequent and drawn out in these B-movies. While I've seen some pretty bad ones before, I think Night Fright takes the cake for some of the worst dance moves I've ever seen in one of these. They're all so stiff. Worst, or maybe best to some people, but they keep cutting to this lady's butt. What's so special about it that we need to keep seeing it? And it's not even that big. I want her ass out of there today! There is a scene towards the end of the movie where the characters just sit around and wait for the monster to come to them. The repetitive soundtrack and almost real-time wait with no time dilation makes this shit insufferable. Night Fright's title is a total lie. It never takes place at night, at least in real life, and there isn't a single fright in sight. I'm physically incapable of seeing more of these Zontar likes. I have no genuine or even ironic enjoyment out of cynically produced B-movies like this that exist purely as drive-in fodder, made exclusively to be ignored while couples make out. Time has moved on from movies like this. The worst part is that this movie was outdated even when it came out. And just like how time has moved on, I would like to move on too. Hey, what about your order? 
So an actor I've failed to really make a mention of, despite covering a couple of his movies, is Paul Neishi, a Spanish writer and actor who appeared in dozens and dozens of Spanish horror films. And one role he would frequently revisit would be that of the Wolfman. In a certain area of the earth, a man turns into a wolf. Fury of the Wolfman starts with this guy seemingly returning from another movie we didn't see. He got wounded in an accident that killed his whole crew, and that wound was given to him by a yeti. It's more than a bit of a psychotic start, but it gets better. That yeti, you know, an ape-like Bigfoot creature, was apparently carrying a bit of lycanthropy because that's what gets this guy to turn into a wolf. This illness came from Tibet. Anything can happen there. Anything to justify the main character being a werewolf, I guess. The Yeti is never mentioned again and has no bearing on this plot. After being convinced his wife is cheating on him, and she is... Unfaithful. Unfaithful. Unfaithful! He goes wolf mode and smooches her neck a little too hard, which kills her. In case you were wondering about fairness, he kills the guy she was cheating on him with too. He gets electrocuted as he runs away, and after being dug up by a mad scientist lady, he gets revived and is held captive in her horny dungeon, where she whips him repeatedly. The mad scientist is trying to create a bunch of plant-based servants as well, or something like that. This is all very strange. Can you explain it? There's nothing to explain, really. There are many disparate elements here, from the mad scientist, to the werewolf, to the masked cultist, to the plant people, to the weird sex horror. The dubbing is also just the right level of incongruous with the visuals to be charming. No, I don't want to go on listening to this! This can't be scientific! This can't be scientific! I don't want to- oh. Science wasn't exactly my best grade, but what I could pick up on is utter nonsense, I don't know. Any science whizzes in the audience? You want to try to decipher what she's saying here? It's possible to create a human zebor by using waves of a determined frequency on the brain. Unfortunately, the story is a little lumbering. We're told of the mad scientist's plan, and there's a little bit of plot early on. But it's mainly just a collection of scenes, and sometimes the wolfman appears. There's one part where him and a disillusioned servant try to leave the mad scientist's castle and that becomes the thrust of the plot for a bit. And in case you're wondering, the title doesn't lie. That Wolfman sure do be furious. At irregular intervals. There's apparently a cut of this movie with more nudity, and with how thin the plot of this is, I'm not surprised. It almost has the vibe of an adult film with all the naughty bits removed. It's certainly clumsy and definitely not a good movie, but I enjoyed parts of it, I guess. Put it on if you're in the mood for something trashy. I would be remiss to not mention there's a werewolf lady in this movie too, for all you freaks out there. So yeah, that's all for this week. Tune in next time for another eclectic mix of movies. We've got another snake movie a vampire movie with a title I'm not sure YouTube will let me say, a Roger Corman adjacent movie about Mpreg, and many more. Why? Thanks for making it to the end of the video, and also, a big thank you to all of my patrons. I know it's been a while since I've made a video in general on your end, and I apologize for that. It's just, you know, with these longer projects, it takes them a little longer to cook. I'm, I'm doing my best here. Uh, burnout is real. I'm recording this end slate on August 12th, so hopefully by the time this goes public that burnout will have subsided. Anyways, here is a shout out to the top patrons who get videos like this one early. Manila Fan, Gazner, Sampai, Ors, Golden Made Me an Ultraman Fan, Swoosh McJuice, Navek15, Jacob Hinch, Dude Bro, Griffith J. Hertenstein, Alastair Gilmore, Seamus Kelly, Anonymous Euronymous 1349, Fujoshi Urinal, Ryman Ruin, Mulan Nguyen, Ultraman Taro vs. Leo, Irrelevant 402, Hey I'm Mooney, Krazak 53, Komen, Queer Kaiju, 
Chronicler Wava, Alcoholic Alligators, Ryan Santa Cruz, Avak Robot, The Antagonist, Richard C. of Ardon, It's God Z, Big Odilo, An Actual Demetrodon, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you all very much.